So, Eamon, uh, <laughs> I said the season's finished, but uh, the work just keeps going, doesn't it? Absolutely, uh, Alex. Uh, this weekend would have seen a, a lot of uh, clubs hosting end of season awards, you know, mini league finals all uh, coming to a crescendo. I'm sure there's lots of clubs out there that had bouncy castles and face painting, but uh, I suppose that it's the trophies being given out uh to individual uh teams um and also player of the year awards you know that's just uh very empowering for for young kids to to receive trophies um and you know this weekend would have seen wholesale um trophy sales and um been handed out to the worthy recipients but for for all the clubs and all the organization that's gone on uh, you know it brings a, a, a close to the chapter on the 2022-23 season. But clubs will be about their business uh, straight away tomorrow and, you know, 23-24 will come down the track straight away. And, um, you know, clubs need to be about uh, preparing for the upcoming season. So it's it's business as normal, really. Well, you know, it's interesting because yesterday at the uh, FAI grassroots convention at the Aviva Stadium, um, one of the questions asked um, um, asked by Mark Canham, I think, um, was, you know, you know, people were able to answer it online or whatever. And one of the questions was about, you know, whether people favoured calendar year or um, winter seasons, you know. And it's important to, for us to realise that, a percentage, uh, in fact, it was kind of 50, 50, 60, 40 kind of thing, but a, a large percentage of affiliates and leagues and teams play, are still playing, are actually playing their season now. And they, uh, from a, from your perspective, and you're well in the know, if you had to say out of, you know, out of 100 teams, what percentage of, of teams are currently playing? Apparently, there's about 1,100 clubs, but what percentage of teams do you think are actually playing um, are still playing their season now, playing in summer leagues. Yeah, I, I, calendar well, year. I, I, I don't know the exact figure. And of course, calendar year football was pushed heavily by the FAI a few years ago. And, you know, it, it caused a lot of dissent, a lot of friction within within many leagues. But I know there are many leagues who are more than happy with uh, calendar year uh, football. I know the, the amateur league here in Dublin uh, still going. Um, I, I know the Kildare League, Kildare and District League will be run calendar year over in Mayo, uh, and they were one of the first in many, many years ago. And I, I recall talking to a journalist over there, and he, he told me that the the year before, when they were on the traditional, you know, September to May June season, they'd lost close to three hundred matches uh, because of weather. And the first year in in calendar year football, they lost something like ten, eleven, or twelve. And most of them were for, for believe it or not, stag weekends and weddings. So there, there are there, there's traditionists who who like, you know, the idea of the September to to May, June uh, season, and what that tends to, you know, when you drill down into it, you find that a lot of kids go back to school in September, and that's where a lot of the schoolboys would focus their starting point on, you know, that there are holidays throughout the summer and, um, you know, like players missing. But you also got to remember in Ireland, and I know, you know, like global warming uh, ha is having its own impact. But uh, traditionally, I mean, the, the, the pitches are at their best during uh, summer, you know, where the, the grass is greener and uh, the weather is better. Um Whereas, you know, if you're you're facing into a bleak winter and, you know, you always sort of, you always are concerned for substitutes standing on the line, shivering, just, you know, eager and anxious to get onto the field of play to warm up. Um, so there, there, there are two camps here. And, uh, you know, if it was 90-10, you know, you might have a different argument. When it's 50-50, well... You know, it's 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 quite difficult. And the FAI, I mean, did push a couple of years ago to have a calendar year season across the uh, um, 
the whole of their their affiliates but the decisions were made at local level in in, in many cases and some of them opted to go uh she mentioned like northeast football league um mead cavan loud they're running a, a winter or a, a calendar year season as well and you got to remember that a lot of these leagues are run very successfully and equally so the traditional you know, sort of uh, season starting in September, late August, September, also run very successfully. Um, so trying to get everybody onto the one page is a very, very difficult thing to do in Ireland. Uh, and I don't yeah. think that's going to change too much. No, I don't think so. And, and, and it, you know, it's, 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 it, it's, it's nice to have these type of breaks where, where teams can go off on trips and do different things and clubs can have these mini world cups that uh, seem to be so successful and people enjoying them so much, but um, more, uh, more about the, the stuff that's going on, especially the representative football that we we've seen so much of lately. We're just back from the regions cup and um, you know, we had a, a, the FAI schools finals were on there. Oops, we're on there in the, uh, in the AUL. We managed to get, catch a couple of those, couple of those games and um you were the goalkeeper Alex were you? one second <laughs> but um yeah quite interestingly I, ha- I had a great experience but you yesterday you were out with the uh, CP Ireland and um, tell us a bit more about that yeah several yeah out, in, yeah out the end of uh, uh, the AOL complex uh, I, I'm always uh, so impressed when I go out to the AOL complex for the CP Academy football sessions uh, there's about 80 kids there yesterday um the CP Ireland international team has recently returned from uh, Sardinia where they they made the semi-finals um coming out of their group which included uh, Scotland Germany and Ukraine and they included a, a five nil thumping of our, our German friends, and also put one over our fellow uh, Celtic friends as well. But uh, they came up short against England, who uh, I believe had a player who's just signed for the uh, same name that Rick, Wrexham have recently come out of. Uh, so a very talented player on their books and in in the uh, bronze match for for third and fourth place they 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 went down to spain and like spain you know they're a benchmark across europe for for doing things right i think uh, a lot of it underpinned by by futsal uh pet subject of ours but uh yeah yesterday i spoke with joe murky uh, the captain and uh you know these guys pulling on that green jersey, it means so much to them. They're representing their family, their clubs, their locality. Joe's from Carrick Macross in County Monaghan. And uh, I'm looking at some of the, the, the insights on the, the Facebook page today, it's getting lots and lots of likes. So, you know, to go out and uh, lead your team out uh, is huge. I'm speaking to uh, the manager as well, Mick Doyle. Mick will be one of the academy uh, coaches up with the, the uh, CP uh, Academy and he stepped in uh, to the breach only in February and I think they had 18 weeks of a lead in uh, but uh, Mick is a very very talented coach very good with the kids I mean there's always a very strong bond between players and coaches it's, it's very much a family atmosphere when you go up to the AOL complex and it comes in under the uh, football for all radar uh our platform and uh, you know they're ruthlessly efficient uh donald and rachel you know two of the the administrators you know behind the scenes very very professional how they go about their business and you know the kids just love it when you go up there on a saturday so you know I'm, I'll talk about this in a second, but I was out with um, uh, Tessa and Sanat um, regarding the the futsal, international futsal Irish team, um, the Down Syndrome Irish team, and um, the Down Syndrome Ireland team. And so, you know, I, obviously I'm just learning about it now, but uh, I'm assuming like the several, so they have an, a senior international team of yeah. senior men who represent Ireland. Um, and they are they are 
they are filtered from a, a range of uh, several policy players who play yeah. in. How does, can you shed some yeah, light well, on how that works? Well, because well, what, what I got a sense of is. There's players coming from all over Ireland that, you know, there's, there's an intermediate, there's a junior academy. And the great thing about yesterday is that some of the, the, the international, senior international guys were in attendance and like they, they were superstars for these younger kids and they can see that pathway, you know, from, from, uh, you know, when they come into the academy all the way up to senior international uh, uh, football. And um, Mick Doyle was telling me that he was able to give debuts to five new players in Sardinia. And these are guys who've come through the ranks and uh, to cap them, uh, which is, you know, like it's a, uh, a signal day in any player's career to to line out and you know enter the field of play for your country. So uh, you know they 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 came up short on the field of play, but they've absolutely scored and knocked it out of the park. And what they've achieved uh, in terms of participation, and you, you always got to remember that you know football in many ways it, it's not about the destination; it's the journey. It's about making friends. It's about forming bonds and lifelong friendships and you know to 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 have that experience and i know that they experience you know conditions where it was up to our mid-30s which you know uh, any you know <laughs> normal irishman would, would struggle with no matter what factor you have on but uh like to, to get through to the semi-finals and you know they're they're ranked in the top four in Europe, and that's just a massive, massive achievement uh, and great recognition uh, for them. And I have to say, you know, the, the FAI funded the trip, uh, and, and we're very, very strong uh, um, collaborators in everything that they've done. And I know everybody up at the CP Football Academy are extremely grateful for, for the National Association's input into the whole program. So, just so that I understand, the the kids that were in the photographs, the the academies, and um, so do they play? Do they play with other? You know, how do they do? They play in, in CP League. Can you yeah. get some light on that? I'm trying to understand the kind of the more yeah, junior they, side, they, side of it. They play challenge matches every so often, you know. So they the the the, the opposition would travel out to the AOL complex and uh, uh, offer opposition. Um, so it might be, you know, an underage club. I know Rohini United were out there. I think the last time I was out and, and they would have other clubs who go out. And I should also say that uh, the CP Academy has recently started uh, a girls team. And I believe there's a there's a tournament coming up in, uh, in I think it's Denmark and Copenhagen in a couple of months time. And really, you know, like uh, I know that they're they're always looking for for influx of new players to come into the program, uh, but it's a it's a, it's a wonderful platform, wonderful setup, and there, there's extremely good uh, um, uh, coaching on hand. I know they 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 they've introduced uh, um, sports science into it in terms of uh, their conditioning and in Cherry, you know, sort of well-known League of Ireland goalkeeper is the goalkeeping the coach uh, for for the academy. So you know they 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 they're setting extremely high standards for themselves, and that can only benefit the players. You know when they step across the whitewash. Okay, so so from my understand, so my, my understanding is the whole exercise really is about widening, widening the net. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, it, so it, it's more, it's an, yeah, it's an academy, so it's training, coaching, um, you know, tactical, what goes on in in the complex, but it's 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 preparing them for international you know the academy is a standalone academy there is a, a a national team uh out there and you know i i'd understand that there there are other um cp academies operating around the country but this one in, in dublin does attract players from from around the country who travel up on a saturday uh to to the complex and uh you know they're there two and a half three hours they 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 be given lunch uh before they depart 
for the four corners, but uh, very well structured. And I, I know the, the CP Academy are extremely grateful to the Athletic Union League out in Clunchock who, who don't charge them uh, for hire of the facilities that they, they recognize the benefits and, and, you know, it's a very benevolent uh, act on the part of the AOL that they provide those excellent facilities that they have out in Clonshock for the CP Football Academy. Well, I had a fantastic experience uh, yesterday. I went out to, um, actually went out to, it's qu it's quite close to, um, I don't know what the name of it is. Is it the Technical University out in Blanchetown? TU Blanche, is this? TU, TU yeah, it used to be IT Blanche, but TU, TU Blanchetown, Technical University Blanchetown, Blanchetown <clears throat> not too far from yeah. uh, so, the headquarters in Abbottstown, yeah. That's right, yeah. So if, anyway, I found the um, the, the sports hall. It's quite well hidden, <laughs> even though it's right beside the car park. But um, I found it, and uh, it was brilliant. I, I set up a camera um, to capture some of the, the content. Uh, we captured, um, we did a squad GIF. I was managed to interview all the parents and get a sense of the journey of each player. A sense mm -hmm. of the, the you know how involved the community were even in 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 hearing that the the guys got news of of their selection on the team and also i learned about the the challenges and the also the help the community have been providing in terms of fundraising as the families need to uh, fundraise to go on this trip uh, i learned about the trip itself it's a uh, it's a european down syndrome championships so there's I don't know if there's a problem there with the sound, but the, so the good thing about it is that there's also athletics and artistic swimming. Mm -hmm. So there was a guy, a, a guy there called Liam and another girl who are, that was very interesting to interview those parents. But the, the real thing that I got from the whole, I mean, it, it was brilliant, but it, you know, <laughs> I watched them. I did a little bit of work today and I'd love to, I'd love to just show you some of it. Um, I don't know if you got a chance, but I did a bit of playing around with this. Can I, I'm going to show you that here, okay? So, um, yeah, no, that's, that's some of the gifts uh, and the celebrations that the players were getting up to, yeah. Yeah, so I just, yeah, <laughs> I just, they were great. We did a uh, experimental game this year where they, they do the pose, the kind of FIFA pose, and they were having great fun. And uh, we did some of the wraparound ads there, where we put up the the logos into the yeah. uh, into the hall, yeah, um, and of course, yeah, we did that yeah. sponsors. Come on, you can see it the way it appears, like it's, it's, it's actually in there. And so, yeah. Futsal, well, Smith, Futsal Come lends on, itself Aaron. very well to this. Yeah, yeah. No, I, <laughs> was, I, 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 I recognize the venue. Blue, Blue Magic have played out of there many times, so. Uh, uh, interesting to see the doors open and daylight come in. Uh, uh, you know, it's usually nighttime when I go out there. But uh, yeah, look at a great facility. And a lot of these uh, universities and technical universities have absolutely brilliant facilities. Uh, you know, 4G, 5G pitches, uh, and the best of, best of of uh, um, surfaces to play on, whether indoors or outdoors. And uh, you know, while, while the universities would have their own teams, isn't it great that the facilities can be utilised, you know, outside the academic year as well? That uh, you know, the, the the Down syndrome Ireland can go in and avail of those facilities as they prefer for their upcoming uh, European campaign in uh, Padova in Italy. Absolutely, they were very good. The the the. The caretakers of the facility were very good. They let me access areas that were kind of close so that I could get a better camera angle on the pitch. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I want to make a couple of <laughs> observations. Um, so on Friday night, <clears throat> Friday night, I was out at the um, at UCD. Actually, I called into the UCD match against Sligo. Um, the UCD were 1-0 down and I went in with the kids and they were 2-1. Two two one, two one, they, they were winning 2 one after about 15 minutes of me going in so i was lucky to see the two oh, goals but um so i brought the kids over to the, the sports hall mm -hmm. in ucd and i took some photographs of the uh not a futsal goal in sight um a fantastic facilities but not a futsal goal in sight and i know they're not using futsal because they had the small ones there 
But um, I then went out to TU to um, and great, they had the futsal goals there. But incredible, um, and you'll probably see this in the video, the walls behind the goal are white. Mm -hmm. So effectively, the goalposts are pure white. And white no on one white. ever makes pure white goalposts. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know. Yeah, there it, for a film. Yeah. You can just see how good these. Yeah, I mean it's it that's how far behind we are that even the goals yeah. we have invested in are white. Um and you know it's, it's just a, a point that I wanted to make. But it was kind of, you know, is the guys were doing an incredibly good session yesterday. It was um you know, looking at I did an hour I, I, I basically covered the whole session. They were there for two and a half hours and I got about an hour and a half worth of, of football and I was actually looking at the the training being provided by by uh, Sean and uh, Paul Smith there, and it was brilliant. You know the the you know off I so much off the ball movement in 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 futsal, and then obviously in that little video you can see the accuracy of their shooting and the skills that these guys these athletes have, and one of the things that came out of the chats with Tessa and um, Sinesh was that. that um, a lot of the players there have experience of playing in in the special olympics for example but in the special olympics it's they're not with the same they're not with their peers and so what happens that's brilliant for them in down syndrome ireland with these kind of down syndrome based competitions and when, mm -hmm. when they're playing with their peers with the people you know with the same kind of um conditions you know mm -hmm. they really kind of excel in that environment and what they're trying to do is try to widen the net as, as tessa says you know she they're trying to make sure that parents out there know that there are sporting activities that are really really good for their child's development and um you know to try to come along and and, and try and this, and the, i did i got so many beautiful interviews with the parents that are so important over the next few weeks that we'll be sharing on our platform because you know that's what this whole thing is about yeah you know um athletes yeah like uh the football for all program you know the feli run uh hugely important that there are so many uh individual platforms i did notice today uh, across channel that there was you know we always talk about ability and not disability but uh uh, in England today, they had the Disability FA Cup Final, which is an interesting concept that, you know, I, I, I assume it was various uh, platforms all competing for, for an FA Cup, which is something that perhaps, you know, the powers that be over here might look at, uh, you know, where they're standalone, but actually bring them all under an umbrella and run off a uh, 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 an FAI disability cup uh might be a, an idea for the future <clears throat> I, I i think when you go and speak to these people whether it's down syndrome or uh, uh um the cerebral palsy uh, uh people that they're always looking to bring new people in and yes they're looking to identify players but they're they're looking to bring people in to play with their peers uh and and form bonds of friendship and you know that's all part of the journey uh and you know like my own experience you know going out to the cp uh, ireland uh, academy is how encouraging other parents are of of their own you know siblings uh, um efforts that they're always encouraging every single kid to be the best they can possibly be and uh, you know i think it's a hallmark of the training sessions that there's so much uh, clapping and applauding and cheering that goes on and it's not a it's not a competitive environment. It's a, it's a training session. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, moving on from there, I mean, from our perspective, all this representative football, you know, um, it all falls under the same umbrella. You're donning your you're donning a green jersey, you know, like when we were doing the the, the squad gif, which I was so honoured to do, um. And I made a point of saying this to the parents afterwards. You know, I brought the team in and I had a chat with them before explaining what we were going to do. And you know, I I turned yeah, around and I, I feel honoured that I'm I, I got a chance to to do this for you guys mm -hmm. because you know you're at the top of the tree. You're representing your country, 
and um you know i then went ahead and did it and they were brilliant at it i mean i've done it so many times now that um i'd say they were the best that i've that i've done it with do you know what i yeah, mean in, in the sense that they they, they all they know did something different yeah there was no innovations you know that the, there was no shyness about it they just sort of rocked up and you know uh, and their character uh, came out and how they expressed themselves you know and that's it's, it's always wonderful to see yeah well look i just want to mention another thing just that's coming up in terms of um something we should be um where is it here is it here um i want to talk about the uh, pitch pioneers one second um let me see hide that one and show that one. is it coming up no yeah i see it here what's it is it coming up yeah i can see it pitch pioneers oh, there. sorry you have to. Historical projects so I I think can I can yeah yeah, sorry, that was me. I'm just, uh, my computer's acting up, I think. Um, but look, I wanted to talk about something. That we're working on a couple of projects with a couple of clubs, and I just want to let people uh, know about about them. Um, so there's a lot of clubs that are coming up on their 30, 40, 50, 100-year anniversaries. And um, some of those clubs have their their pioneers, their, their, their founders are still with us. And, um, you know, there's clubs are always looking for ways to generate income and what we've been talking about them and obviously we've been having these discussions is you know there's ways of making like let's say these kind of historical interviews so we go down and we go to a club and we kind of take as much content as as possible and um, including the the two or three founder members who are still with us and um, and try and lay that down, try and get that on camera, try and get it. And we, we, we will do a striker job and, and, and create a kind of like hour long, hour and a half long documentary type thing um, for, led by them. You know, obviously, aiming yourself, you'd be driving the questions and getting the right kind of content out. And then we'll do also some kind of content on the The younger generations that are at the club now yeah. you know a bit on the club and we build that into a kind yeah. of a package um and uh, our idea is that you know we do this as a collaboration with the club and we make it strong enough that it's something that local businesses want to chip in you know and and together we build this you know and we build it and they will come so it's something that you know we're working really hard to find ways to help clubs to get the content that's in there, you know, and, and part of that process would be um, these photographs that I believe are at every football club. There's a load of photographs in a shoebox in the attic or in some kind of part of the club or in someone's home. And these are photographs that haven't seen the light of day. And yeah. a striker, the, the part of the service is to digitize those photographs and have them, you know, inside that, that program, that kind of, historical documentary or that kind of interview yeah there's so many clubs out there who are sitting on you know what, what's gold us really in terms of the historical journey that they have traveled and you know, always find that somebody in every club cutting has photographs you know you know they've got the the menus from the awards night uh and they're tucked away whether it's in the shoebox or in a suitcase under the bed or in the attic. And what we're trying to do is to put the spotlight on these clubs and have them as an historical record for them, but to do it using, you know, uh, modern uh, 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 platforms and using social media that we can literally chronicle their journey in, in a video format. And, it's a way of of reaching out and you know there's clubs who would have ex players in the four corners of the world and it'd be great to be able to share these old photographs and you know uh, there, there there might be pictures out there where you can name eight nine 
or 10, but you're missing one name. And the idea is to try and curate and identify uh, as much as we can and have an historical library for as many grassroots clubs out there who have significant milestones that they're about to reach. And like that's that's it's 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 a very interesting project from our point of view, but really we're only going to be as good as the clubs who say that's a good idea need to contact Striker Online. Ready and waiting. Exactly, and you know, yeah, exactly, and especially especially when we have um, founder members who are nearing, you know, are getting older, they're not getting any younger, so you know it is a really um, it's something that we firmly believe in and are willing to work with clubs so that there is no upfront cost or whatever that we work with the clubs and and try and generate you know use our commercial acumen and our platform to be able to guarantee the kind of exposure that the sponsors and the people that you know at the end of the day will be helping to fund the process and um, but but you know yeah, at so the end it, you know the, the, it's a collaborative effort yeah, no, it's a, I think it's a win-win So, yeah, I, I just wanted to talk. So, I, the other area that I wanted to touch on was actually um, the, uh, I may not have written this down, but um, was just in terms of the a slight change that we want to try and make. So, um, um, Striker Online is becoming more, online oriented more video oriented and um one of the things we're trying to become is more efficient with how we handle results and fixtures so um due to the way that the platforms work these days we want to try and um deliver something on a weekly basis so this grassroots ground up um it's part of that process where we try and invest our time on a Sunday night um, or might be sometimes a Monday morning uh, into a roundup of the grassroots week with a look into the to, to the to the coming days and in this in the when we post this inside there'll be links to whatever websites or or stuff all affiliates should now have websites with the results and with their league tables yeah uh yeah uh, like sundays can be extremely difficult because leagues presented in different formats and we're trying to extract the information and some of it is extremely problematic you know and the last thing you want to do is get into a double keystroke where somebody has already typed it and you end up having to type it out again and like I, I, you're right alex that a lot of these fixtures and results are already available uh and if they're available we'll we'll provide those links but it allows us to to give an enhanced service by putting the spotlight on on various leagues uh, and discussing and inviting you know managers or players in uh, to discuss matches of the day or indeed looking ahead to upcoming matches, whether it's a, it's the local derby or it's the top of the table clash, or indeed the bottom of the table uh, relegation six pointer. Um, and I think by, by doing that, we, we can we can create the bait. Um, we can put the spotlight firmly on the grassroots game. And we can also give, a, a, you know, a platform to, to leagues out there who want to be part of, you know, the Striker Online um, a journey as well. And, you know, like there's an open invitation for leagues that, you know, if you feel that, this is something that that appeals to you you know please make contact and uh, we're, we're happy to you know discuss what we can do for you yeah so one of the things one of the key things that we're trying to do is to ensure that we you know are national that we're going into all the different affiliates you know <laughs> you know them all better than i do aim and i am I find it hard to keep up with all the different um, the structures, but yeah. uh, we want to make sure that we give we give a voice and airtime to everyone. So we would be keen to be, you know, talking to, you know, having five minute interviews on a Sunday night with anyone who wants to get on board, and and we're open to holding interviews with anyone who wants to give yeah. us content, have a chat about their current situation, their hopes, their aspirations, their plans. 
have a gripe if you you know whatever this is um this is grassroots football we believe with the with the irish the, the the voice of irish grassroots football so we want we we want to encourage people just to get in touch send us content get send us ideas um, and it go, it grows from there yeah yeah i think uh, previously you know in another life we were, we were in a printed format and you know the 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 argument we we used to make to provincial leagues you know leagues outside of dublin is that we can't replicate what local newspapers can do you know give you two three four five pages we just wanted to give you a, a national platform so it, it would have ended up as a roundup maybe truncated and not to everybody's liking that they, they felt that they were getting the, uh, the short end of the stick but it was to give everybody a national uh, uh platform um to 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 showcase what was going on in in the various uh you know regional leagues uh you know uh, as much to the leagues in in the greater dublin area but the the, the beauty of uh, social media is that you know it, it's an open platform and if people want to come on and and give us content well we'll reciprocate that by giving you the platform to get that content out there yeah and uh, moving on to um you know i i i've got a lot done this weekend i managed to get out to the aviva uh, grassroots contract conference there from the fai and mm -hmm. um it was it was it was actually very good and um, i got there for the second half of it and and, and um just to explain to the people that got some 200 people there anyway but just to explain that what was going on so they, they had a kind of a, a a few presentations uh with a lot of um engagement in terms of you know asking questions of probably people have experienced that with the um regional meetings that they've had recently and then they had i thought was very good where they had these kind of kind of booths set up which looked after specific areas of the grassroots game like girls football women's football futsal you know, FEI schools, uh, refereeing section, things like that. So it was kind of done in a, in a like conference, type, conference type approach, you know. And uh, I have to commend the FAI on that. I, on that. I thought it, I thought it was very good and a good initiative. And uh, it looks like they're going to do it again next year, and it'll probably be bigger. Um, but it was very professional and very well delivered technically, and. Uh, in the second section, it was a little bit, there was kind of a lot of, there was a good, good bit more talking about it. They went through a similar question and answer thing where you, you put your answers in and you got a, you got a feeling, you got your response to the crowd. Yeah. And Mark Canham made a, a very good presentation where he was delivering the current strategy. And, mm. and that's summer it's summarized in the sense that you know they're doing this kind of exploratory work and now they've taken all that information on and they're doing this kind of development of a strategy and they're going to be yeah. implementing that strategy at the end of the year coming into the new in the new year next year yeah so i think i think they're trying to communicate that you know they're really working hard to get everybody's um input and they're trying to make sure that you know well we gave you an opportunity you know um it seems to me like it's the same situation that that uh it's it's very communication issue sometimes so for example i didn't even know the grassroots this grassroots convention was on and uh so there is sometimes a, a miscommunication and maybe they didn't want to sell it too much because there's only 250 seats but but it was it was good and they talked about two areas, you know, when they say pathways, you know, most people think that pathways only means, you know, your pathway to professional football. But mm -hmm. Mark Hannum did a very good job of insisting that pathways <clears throat> had two angles. One is obviously to international football. You know, how do we filter through to 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 get as many players and our skill sets up to the standard we need to get them but the other one was pathways to continue a lifelong relationship with football and yeah, uh, and i think he, 
I think he nailed it there, to be honest with you. Yeah, well, look, I wasn't in attendance, but I, I would be aware in recent times the FEI have had uh, TV advertisements about uh, volunteering and getting involved in the game and, and trying to create an environment where, you know, you're reaching out into the community. And, uh, you know, I think I've seen some some uh, uh, Dublin bus uh, sport and some, some FEI ads as well. And I think it's very important that, uh, you know that this resonates with the with the grassroots community uh, throughout the country. I think in recent years, perhaps the FEI had bigger fish fish to fry, and there might have been a, a, an element of uh, discontent within the grassroots. But obviously, that recent facilities investment uh, vision uh, strategy document, where you know they they've uh, obviously it's going to require a lot of capital investment, but the the largest tranche of of that money. Uh, I think it was 863 million, but the bulk of it is being targeted at grassroots. And that's hugely welcome uh, for so many clubs around the country, uh, whether it's the installation of, uh, you know, all weather surfaces where upgrading of pitches, upgrading of facilities. Um, we got to remember that the association football remains the biggest participation sport uh, in the country, and it requires a massive, massive investment. And obviously, with the 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 uh, women's World Cup coming up in Australia very soon, and New Zealand, we're expecting a massive explosion in um, girls' football and participation numbers. And clubs have to be able to accommodate. And it's no no longer an excuse to say we don't have the facilities. You know, we're not taking girls. It's twenty twenty three, and girls have as much right to play football uh, as boys. And clubs have got to, you know, recognise that. And I think the FEI are, are doing a good job here by by uh, hosting um, platforms like they did in the Aviva on Saturday, where they're trying to create that environment to get people involved, but not alone involved, but also to stay in the game and make that contribution uh, to their local community and indeed to their local club. Yeah, well, I understand what you're saying. I mean, you know, there is there's two 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 things that I want to say to you there. One of the points that I made to Mark, but I only made one point to Mark Adam, which was, you know, uh, we're talking about facilities development here. And the fact is that the growth of the grassroots game, the growth of football at the moment, there is no way that our current infrastructure, even if you even if you doubled the amount of facilities we have, right, we still wouldn't have the volunteers able for it. So mm -hmm. we're creaking at the seams, in my opinion. And, um, you know, we are not going to be able to deal with the amount of, of, of people who want to play the game. And, and what we're seeing is um, both at six aside, seven aside, uh, in, you know, all these other games, these kind of branches of football is growth. We're seeing growth in football everywhere. And so... Um, it's very hard to get on an 11 a side pitch it's difficult it's even difficult to keep an 11 a side team going everyone knows that you know whether it's over 35s it's difficult it's it's just tough but but at the moment one of the points we made was we have hard surfaces both indoor and outdoor at every primary school and post primary school in the country you know and they can be turned into yeah. um into futsal olympic handball pitches walking football pitches with an investment of 1500 euro for two futsal goals that's going to last about 15 years each you know mm -hmm. uh, i'm not saying that is something that you know can, can help to ensure that kids get access to football because we know they're not going to get access to the ssg game they're not not mm -hmm. they're not going to be able to satisfy we don't have the volunteers to do that but, but anyway that was one one thing but talking about the facilities, and I need to understand this because maybe other people are in the same boat as myself. The facilities development plan from the FAI, that's kind of like just an idea that they're putting forward, isn't it? They're yeah, just saying it, it, to, the, to the government. Well, it, it's actually it's actually based on, on research. And, you know, they, 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 they've actually commissioned studies uh to stand up the figures that they've 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 come up with and it's all based around um evidence-based 
um, work carried out on behalf of the FAI. And they're saying, like, it's over a 15-year period that this is what it's going to take to match the growth. So, you know, there's government growth or there's government uh, contributions, there's UEFA, there's FIFA, there's uh, private, there's public uh, monies that they, 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 they're they going to look to target. Um, but, like, with any project, you got to start somewhere. So the work that they've undertaken to date is to spec out what it's going to cost. And it's, it's uh, you know, it's a, it's a sizable amount of money. Um, but the game is continuing to grow in numbers. And, like, the the uh, the influx of, of girls' participation is just going to skyrocket uh, the numbers involved in the game. And unless we invest in facilities, we will struggle to cater for the numbers involved. So it's 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 a you know is it the right time? Maybe it should have happened 10, 15 years ago, but now that it, that it's come to pass, you know that must be matched with getting volunteers into the game, and not alone getting volunteers into the game. But one of the areas where where clubs have always struggled is actually retention, and having this cradle to the grave belief that you know, if you join a club that there's always a role for you, whether it's as a player, as a coach, as a manager, you know, as a, a, a groundsman, a, you know, a, you know, a member of management, whatever it is, that there's a role for you to play in a local club. Yeah. Okay, well, look, just we're coming up to the end of our uh, programme in and I just want to look at the week ahead or the couple of weeks ahead. I, you know, it's hard to catch your breath. It's hard to catch your breath at the moment. But I'm, um, I've got to, I've got to finish off my content or our content from this weekend and, and meet up with Tessa and and Sines regarding a strategy going forward for the September championships. I want to try to meet with uh, Emmett Switzer regarding the uh, Six Aside World Cup. With, which is happening in the Middle East. Um, I have a meeting with Class Kicks, um, that's a really innovative football boots that they're, they're for kids, for introducing kids into football. And, um, and um, um, I don't know, I, I haven't, I, I have to look at my diary. What have you got? <laughs> well, there's never, never a dull day, you know. I, I always end up doing something in front of the computer one way or another. Um, so you know, normal week for me is actually a busy week. Uh, probably still recovering from all the, the 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 huge input that we generated over in the UEFA Regions Cup. Um, but like uh, Alex, there's always planning. There's always something to do. You know, and you know, uh, I'm looking to give the the laptop a bit of a holiday. But uh, so far, I haven't been able to manage it. Look, you did touch on, you know, what we're talking about and what we're talking about. Uh, you know, we've mentioned futsal a couple of times tonight and it's a pet subject of mine. And I cannot, I cannot get my head around why there are not more people interested, why there's a complete lack of empathy for the sport. It's absolutely brilliant. It's great for your 11 side development as a standalone sport. It's absolutely fantastic. And so many people involved in 11 side football in Ireland are missing the biggest trick of all time by not engaging in this wonderful sport. We'll continue to beat the drum on it. And uh, I know there's good work being done, yeah. FAI schools, AOL, and around the country, a futsal, great sport. You need to investigate it. You need to get going. Yeah, well, we'll leave it at that as our first uh, edition of the Grassroots Ground Up. I appreciate your time, and uh, I hope we make a, a habit of this every every Sunday night. I look forward to this, even if it has to be over a pint occasionally. <laughs> okay, Alex, no problem. Thanks, Eamon. Have, have a good night. Cheers, Mike. All right, see you then. Bye-bye.